हेलो आर वी ऑडिबल थैंक यू I'm afraid that the microphone in the auditorium is muted.
education and he has written numerous articles on uh, topics in physics and astronomy uh, in that journal so um, uh, many of us here uh, also know rajaram for a long time uh, so i will uh, not take uh, more time of uh, yours and uh, we will begin with today's program of uh, the lecture so i will first invite uh, uh, Professor Yashwan Gupta and Rajana to present the uh, the Govind Sarup Memorial Medal. You that this was coming. <laughs> you didn't know. Right? No. Uh, so now we will start with. Uh, lecture. Thanks. Uh, Yashwan. Thanks, uh, Ruta, for the introduction. Do I need a mic? No, certainly not in the auditorium. Yeah, okay. Uh, Thanks to everyone at NCRA. Uh, quite apart from the medal, I've already had my reward for coming here in yesterday's visit to the GMRT in this morning's interaction with colleagues. So, uh, what is that? Yes. Uh, you see Govind Swarup's iconic smile, and you also see uh, the page front page of an article, which was commissioned by the Annual Reviews of Astronomy and Astrophysics in 2020. And now, uh, this volume, for those who have not looked at it, uh, maybe the editors sit down and invite a uh, dozen or so people to give the state of the art in different areas of astrophysics. But they especially invite one person to write an introductory article, and they give that person complete freedom to talk about uh, their life, their work, their perspectives, whatever they like. And Govind received this summons from Sandra Faber, herself a very eminent astronomer. If I remember right, early in 2020, and he handled it characteristically. He immediately wrote to many of us <laughs> saying, OK, now uh, these are the things I have in mind. You check this, you check that, and so on. Right? So, uh, so I was a kind of witness to the whole process of this article. And as late as July, I, I looked and saw an email where uh, he asked the editor, have I exceeded the limit? And she said, no, you have 100 words more. She said, OK, I will put in this paragraph and so on. So that's, that's going for you. OK. And the other characteristic which comes out, and this I've heard from his colleagues in Uti, is that he used to move around, travel a lot. And then people would ask him, how can you get anything done if you move around? And he said, it's exactly the other way around. because." I'm going to leave on some journey. I will ensure that everything gets finished, both by pushing myself and by pushing you. Okay, And I think that's exactly what happened in uh, the production of this article. He left us in September. Okay. In this article, he relates one of his early inspiring experiences at Allahabad, where he was doing his bachelor's and master's. Uh -huh. A visit by... C.V. Raman. So there is an actually uh, uh, further connection. Uh -huh. This keeps moving. Yeah. So this is K.S. Krishnan who joined C.V. Raman in 1920, just in time for the Raman effect. <clears throat> he had a major role in this discovery. Later on, went on to a very distinguished career, including teaching in Allahabad University. So Govind actually learned electricity and magnetism from him. Now in 1947, uh, uh, the call of newly independent India, a national physical laboratory was set up, and K.S. Krishnan was its first director. And uh, Govind joined him okay, in 1950. Um, he took up some work in electron paramagnetic resonance, condensed kind of matter physics, if you like. Uh, but in 1953, Krishnan felt that radio astronomy was something interesting, and maybe this thing could be done in those days. He called up people in 
CSIRO in Australia. And uh, the arrangement was made that the government would spend two years there. And uh, the first year was to be four internships with four giants of radio astronomy. And the first of those internships was on imaging, which is the topic of this lecture. And most of us don't right, uh, think of Govind purely in terms of imaging because he did so much in other areas. Uh, so that's as far as Govind is concerned. And as far as your speaker is concerned, 20 years later, uh, Raman had another student uh, in, in, in the Institute of Science, 1943, Ram Station. And uh, Ram Station again went on to teach at IIT Madras, which is the same place where I did my MSc. The parallel is not perfect because uh, he left before I could join, but I heard many of his popular lectures. Okay. And then I joined him right? in the National Aeronautical Laboratory. And he put me to work on optics and crystallography, as you heard. But in 1972, he said, look, there are these major lecture, lectures in radio astronomy going on at the Indian Institute of Science. Okay, Why don't you go and listen to it? Uh, I didn't know at that time what he had in mind, but I went there and uh, I couldn't understand Peter Scheuer and Peter Goldreich because they kind of spoke the language of physics. I completely could not understand Ken Kellerman, who was very much a radio astronomer. Okay. Uh, I met him many years later. Of course, he didn't recognize me because I was in the back row, you know, sitting behind all these real radio astronomers. Okay. But he did remember at least two people who followed every word he said, uh, Vijay Kapahi and Pramesh Rao. So in any case, I went back to my condensed matter physics. I didn't realize that Ramseshan had a deep plan in mind. So in uh, 1975, he exported me to the mm -hmm. Raman Research Institute. But you can take a horse to water, it may not drink. So at Aradai, I continued to work in condensed matter physics, optics, etc. And then various things happened, okay, which you will hear about. Imaging. So this is the Kalyan array, right? And the dishes actually, you know, were very much the ones that Govind himself had used in Australia, and they had a long journey via Delhi. Uh, so briefly, the first project which Govind was given was to work with an ongoing project of uh, Christiansen. And uh, they were going to uh, form an image of the sun. Now, if you look at this very long array of uh, radio telescopes, uh, some basic optics will tell you, see if this extends to the east-west, then uh, on the sky, the beam of the radio telescope, which is the kind of area of the sky from which it's most sensitive to radiation, will be extended in the north-south and narrow in the east-west. Uh, and the experts will know that because these telescopes are quite far apart, it produces other beams. Okay? Uh, but fortunately, they are not on the sun, and the sun dominates. So just focus your attention on this beam. Right? So this is what you would call a projection of the intensity distribution over the sun, right? because uh, everything in this beam is added up. And then the beam is scanned across the sun. So I've shown you all the other scans across the sun uh, in parallel, but in those days, I don't think they had the electronic or computing resources to take them in parallel, it was gradually scanned. So it is scan number one. You've got some information about the sun, uh, about the position of any interesting feature on the sun in this direction, but absolutely no information in the other direction, okay? Um, well, uh, if you think a little bit about the geometry of looking at the sun and following it from rise to set, you will realize that, uh, uh, at least as far as you are concerned, the sun is rotating with respect to your antenna. Or maybe it's better to go and set at the sun and see the antenna on the earth rotating. So you will get another set of scans you know, and a, at a different time, an earlier time and at a later time. Okay. So Govind was given this large data set, large by the standards of that time. Okay. He had exactly three months. Um, he had a hand calculator, and it was a <clears throat> remarkably tedious process, which had been more or less worked out by because these people had been worked on these things before, but it had never been carried out on such a big set of uh, measurements. So uh, he himself describes, took a large piece of paper, took each uh, scan. I mean, you do technically what is called a Fourier transform. You write that down in a row, right? And then you do that 
uh, for each scan and they're written down on other rows. So now you have a two-dimensional distribution of numbers on your paper <clears throat> and uh, then you draw contours, okay? And uh, then you get this uh, Fourier transform. And uh, then of course, you have to do a similar process to get back. Uh, fortunately, uh, a high priest of Fourier transforms was there to sort of help him go in, acknowledges he learned a few shortcuts of calculation. Uh, this is a person called Ron Bracewell, who had actually gone, uh, come back from Cambridge, okay, where he had uh, studied with, uh, got his PhD with a person who is not that well known because he really worked in ionospheric physics, a person called uh, J. Ratcliffe. But uh, he should be remembered because his other student, who we will encounter later, was uh, Martin Ryle. Okay? So uh, this is another interesting side to Ratcliffe. I remember in the corridor up here, at some point, these genealogy sites came out where you could look up your thesis advisor, that person's thesis advisor. So Goyal was very excited, right? He said, I just went, I went to Ratlin and so on and so on, and it ended with Newton. Okay. I mean, if, if you had known Goyal, you see, it's not, it's not showing out, it's just delight, okay, that he had. Naturally, I felt a little disappointed because my line terminated at uh, C.V. Raman, okay? As far as I know, he... <laughs> However, uh, to console myself, uh, C.V. Raman was inspired greatly by the works of uh, one John William Strutt, uh, who cleverly changed his name to Lord Raleigh. Okay? And at that point, it merges with Goel and keeps going. <laughs> so we were cousins in some sense. Okay? <laughs> then uh, Goel came back to NPL, but then went back to the US, and then went on to do a PhD with the same Ron Bracewell who had moved to Stanford. And they were doing more sophisticated imaging uh, of the sun now with the uh, array. And very soon, Govin uh, got his PhD and became a colleague of Bracewell. Now, Bracewell is pretty well known. I mean, usually, if you want to learn Fourier transforms, you go to a book by Bracewell. And his book on two-dimensional imaging uh, has a preface. And here's a sentence from that preface. He lists the colleagues with whom he has discussed imaging extensively. This list is not in alphabetical order, but it's probably in chronological order. And right at the top is Govind Swarup. So that is Govind and uh, imaging, uh, so to speak. Now, there's another aspect to this. Uh, the same uh, mathematical process of adding up a whole set of numbers in a two-dimensional image, forming, and then scanning to form a one-dimensional image, uh, very much reflects what happens to you, uh, which I hope not to all of you, uh, when you undo a CAT scan. So let me illustrate the mathematics first. Okay, just put your attention on the left. Okay, so I just have four numbers to start with. Um, so five plus six is 11, seven plus eight is 15. You add up rows, add up columns, and you get these four numbers, 12, 14, 11, 15. So you said, okay, there are four numbers in the square. I've given you four numbers. Can you find them out? And the answer is no, because if you look at the next set of four numbers, I have, uh, I think, uh, added two to the ones in the main diagonal, and I have subtracted two from the other diagonal. And you'll find that the row and column totals are exactly the same. But if you add the total along the diagonal, then you see you can distinguish these two distributions, whether they be distributions of uh, radio intensity on some object, just scanned in different directions, or distributions of uh, some absorbing matter in the patient. Okay. So this is really the basis for uh, CAT scan. Now, there's a technical difference that the CAT scan, the source is very near. The rays are not parallel. Right? You look at the diagram on the right, the, usually the de detectors are fixed in that round setup and uh, it moves, the source moves. But by the time, you've still got an integral of uh, the absorption in every direction. So you can always rearrange it to make it parallel. So it'll be exactly the same problem that uh, was solved by radio astronomers. It's called reconstruction from projections. Uh, so it won the Nobel Prize, but not for the radio astronomers, right? And the history is a bit like this. Uh, it, uh, the prize went to McCormack and uh, Hounsfield. So McCormack was uh, in South Africa, and he got this idea. He did a few very simple experiments. You know, one tube to a cylinder of aluminum, maybe uh, you know, with some wood somewhere. You know, illuminated it, satisfied himself that, and wrote a paper. 
and he was completely ignored. <laughs> okay. So he actually gave up that field and went off to the US to do particle physics till he got a call from the Nobel Committee. Okay, well, not quite true. It sounds better that way. <laughs> but meanwhile, Holmesfield took it up working for a company, EMI. So, uh, so this, I mean, the original Nobel bequest says it could be something for the benefit of mankind. Given how expensive CT scans are, it's certainly for the benefit of the makers of CT scans and the doctors who sometimes get commissions from them, but never mind. <laughs> okay, I'm sure it has saved many lives as well. So actually, Govind has sometimes wistfully said that he should have pursued this parallel. Uh, so his grace well. And in fact, um, the papers by Bracewell in, uh, in Australia, even before he moved, are called strip scanning, aerial smoothing, and so on. Some archaic terminology for what we would call now maybe one-dimensional integration or convolution. But in any case, Bracewell did pursue that field to some extent. Okay. And interestingly, since we're going to talk about crystallography later, uh, the eminent crystallographer G.M. Ramachandran uh, I think rediscovered. So this is the thing. So uh, fortunately, these people don't have to fight about priority because then people found a paper by a mathematician called uh, Redon, okay, Johannes Redon, in 1917. Uh, and uh, the title of his paper is very simple. On the determination of functions from the values of their integrals over certain manifolds. So it sounds even better in German. But yeah. So then, you know, in a sense, Redon was ahead of everyone, but he did it for its own sake, for the love, not the money. Okay. Now, a somewhat similar principle, which I will explain more briefly, underlies the MRI scan, which uh, I, I have to confess that when it comes to crystallography or radio imaging, I've taken a lot of interest in theoretical issues, done simulations, looked over the shoulders of colleagues who are doing the real thing. But the field in which I really have practical experience is uh, CAT and MRI. Okay. Uh, you know, by being pushed into these machines, not too often. So here, <laughs> this is a this is a later prize, uh, which uh, 2003 Nobel Prize, right? Uh, Person and Bloch got the Nobel Prize for this first discovery. So uh, you are two thirds water, and every water molecule, two thirds of the nuclei are uh, protons, and every proton is a magnet. So they push you into this. Uh, 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla nowadays magnet. And uh, it tries to align the magnets parallel to the field. Of course, it is at a finite temperature, so some of them will be in the high energy state, some will be in the low energy state. That's the way it works. Okay. However, this is not just a tiny magnet, it's a tiny gyroscope. And uh, those of you who have handled gyroscopes will know that they are contrary. So if you try and turn it this way, it starts moving this way, right? And therefore, uh, the first reaction of a proton uh, is to precess, right? Then, of course, on some time scale, some friction takes away the energy and it aligns. So once it aligns, you have a few more protons in one direction than in the opposite direction. But now there are very clever ways of applying radio frequency fields. Okay. In fact, one of the experts is in Iser Pune, uh, Mahesh. Maybe he should give a talk on those. So can they, they having got it along the magnetic field can flip it over to the perpendicular direction, and then it goes around and around, and then you put a coil which picks up this time-dependent magnetization. And you learn many things. You may learn the magnetic moment of the proton, what its immediate surroundings in, and so on. Usually, the magnetic resonance people would like a very uniform field because they don't want different things going at different rates and canceling each other. So the brilliant idea of, uh, uh, I think, Lauterbohr and uh, Mansfield this time was that you actually deliberately put a gradient. So the protons in each slice actually rotate at different rates. So then you can, uh, your coil will pick them all up. And then as a function of time, they will get out of phase. And from that signal, you can reconstruct how much is on each slice. And again, you don't do it just in one direction. You have to do it in many directions. So if you've been in any of these machines, uh, you hear some fairly fear, some clanking noises, which is because uh, they switch the gradient coils, right? The main coil is there, and then, and of course, when you have a current inside a magnetic field, then you suddenly change the value of the current, 
there's a huge force on it yeah. and so on. okay so that's mri imaging in a nutshell again utilizes some similar mathematics right because you take one dimensional scans and then you sort of combine them in different directions so we left govind and kalyan i think and uh, then he moved on to kuti it's a magnificent uh, site in this telescope and the job of this telescope was to study uh, radio sources okay uh, so i've shown you a cartoon of a double radio source and uh, uh, this is extended in the north south direction in fact parallel to the earth's axis so the two white lines that are drawn are what you again call the beam of the telescope which extends in the east west so sure it will tell you uh, where the source is to not to a very good accuracy but to the width of the beam it will also it won't may not be able to tell you that it's double but it will also completely combine it with all other sources which lie almost 1 degree to the east or to the west okay so this is where again to quote govin he said we in uti were uh, in the world the only bunch of professional lunatics and if you remember the origin of the word lunatic is people who are in somehow uh, under the influence of the moon so the moon comes along okay uh, and then by the way you have to do something to cancel the emission from the moon which govin did and his friends did right and then it covers up the sources and you can see in this geometry it'll cover them up one at a time right so it's covered uh, by the way in uh, one of the early people to use this for cosmology was vijay kapahi and he introduced uh, the technical terminology for this event which is called gaia ra and after that you have aya ra it comes out on the other side <laughs> and if you look at this geometry you can now see this time the edge of the moon is in a different direction and the two sources get combined so what would you expect so i've drawn a graph uh, so you have some emission uh, some signal and then it drops when the first source gets covered up drops again when the second source gets covered up stays dropped for depending on where you are on the moon up to an hour and then in this particular case the two sources appear together right so you have two scans uh, this itself might not have been too difficult to interpret okay but uh, there is a twist the twist is that you are dealing with radio waves so when the source uh, either appears let's say when the source appears even before when it's still hidden by the edge of the moon uh, basic optics tells you that you will get some radio signal which will keep increasing that's the diffraction going around the edge of the moon and then when it comes out you will get the direct wave from the source you will still get this edge wave and the two will interfere and the signal will go up and down okay so what i call a step is not really a step it is a function like this okay so now uh, the problem is that uh, even to get this one dimensional scan from one of these events you uh, have to appreciate that every single point source has been replaced by this function which is called uh, convolution and if you want to get back to your point source you have to do something called t convolution you have to undo this okay now uh, it's one might i mean today one would just you know ram it through a computer but in 1962 the same peter shoyer i told you about came up with a beautiful uh, analytic solution to this problem okay uh -huh. and uh, if you would like to try your skills on fourier transforms against peter shoyer what you could do is take this function which is uh, just the sum of the absolute squares of two fresnel integrals take its fourier transform take it to the denominator and transform back anyway the net result is a little counterintuitive is that the deconvolution <laughs> is done by further convolution with another function which i am not showing you okay and it's it's a beautiful mathematical solution however it uh, was not quite a practical solution it works perfectly when the data is perfect if there any imperfection in the data any noise which any real data has this second process of deconvolution amplifies it. so of course people had used shoyer's method and therefore they had to reduce the resolution they had to tame this wild oscillations 
of the second function which Schreuer produced, right? And that determined the resolution. Now, uh, one of CR, uh, CR Subramania, one of Govind's students at UT, took up this problem, okay? And uh, of the instability, right? And he created something called the optimum deconvolution method. Uh, he was one of the early users of the computing facilities at TIFR, okay? Uh, and he threw in all the information that you have about this problem. Uh, I've listed them here. The source is surely positive, probably confined to a small region, right? And there is noise and your uh, restoration process should account for that noise. And uh, other things being equal, you might want a somewhat smooth solution. Uh, not easy to do analytically, but you, a good computer program can do it. Right? So let me... Uh, so in this sense, the deconvolution is being done not just with the experimental data, but with this additional input, which is called a priori information. Okay. Um, a priori is actually quite a loaded word. It was used by the philosopher Kant in some debate where some people said that we only know what we get through our senses, but he said, no, there are some things we know even without our senses. Anyway, that debate is still going on. And even in statistics, there's this notion of a prior when you're carrying out some analysis and you're trying to get hold of some parameters, what do you know about those parameters even before you look at the data? Okay. So uh, I'll show you some ODM results. Okay. So if you look at the top two, um, there's the reconstruction by Scheuer's method and Scheuer's method always carries some resolution and so does Sobronian's, okay? So you can see the resolution is about the same, two arc seconds on top and two arc seconds below. ODM seems to have given you a compact thing with three peaks. <laughs> and likewise, if you look at the second pair, again, I think OTL probably stands for, the O probably stands for OT. Okay. I've often wondered, there are these reconstructions. Today, probably someone should go in, not with the GMRT. GMRT doesn't quite have this resolution at 327. So either you go to a higher frequency and just check which of these restorations actually, you know, it's an interesting case where you can actually do it. I hope someone has a shot. It wouldn't take more than a few minutes in GMRT, I would guess, or a comparable telescope. Okay. So uh, this is his 1980 paper, but actually uh, this was gradually spreading in the community. It spread up to RRI by 1975 because his thesis reached RRI, but CRS took his own time, you know, and it finally uh, reached publication, went to a conference first. But he had to defend his thesis and... Uh, so, uh, you know, when you defend your thesis, your colleagues are always there to support you. So his colleague, Ashok Singhal said, as you walk into the room, you have to tell the people gathered, my shoyev to nahi. It's a reference to the popular culture of that time. Uh, I don't think CRS, those of you who know, is too mild-mannered a person to do that. But that's Ashok's suggestion. As I said, meanwhile, you know, in Arai, yeah. thousand meters below Uti, uh, we were having visitors. We didn't have to go to Australia because Australia came to us first in the person of Virada Krishnan and then in the person of all the other people whom he invited over. And he was obviously very respected there. So the same idea of a priori information, but bundled in a different way called maximum entropy. Okay. It's, as I told you, even in the a deconvolution example, you, your data may not be enough to tell you everything. So then you say, of all the possible images, let me pick the one which maximizes some characteristic. In CRS's case, of course, he had his own list. MEM gave you one mantra, that maximize this function. Okay. And uh, John Abel showed us some marvelous results. He very generously shared his uh, computer program with a colleague in our RRI, Rajendra Bhandari, better known for his work in optics and so on. And uh, uh, he was somewhat philosophically inclined and wondering how you can get something from nothing. So he tested it in many situations. And sometimes the MEM gave very nice results, sometimes it didn't, uh, and he wrote it up. Meanwhile, these two visitors, also from uh, CSIRO, Max Komisarov and uh, Roddy Kirsch, came to RRI. And uh, uh, I joined in 1975. Ramesh Narayan, with a very strong background in crystallography uh, from NAL again, <laughs> joined in 1978. So just to tell you how strong his background was, 
he was the son of G. N. Ramachandran. So, if you believe these things are genetic, <laughs> already there. Uh, and just to make sure, G. N. Ramachandran sent him <laughs> to his long, long time colleague Ram Sachin, who again a Christlog, who had distinguished Christlog, do his PhD. He did it a couple of years after me. And just to make sure, he also married a Christlog. Okay. So that's Ramesh. So he came to RRI chock full of Fourier transforms and so many other things, as you all know. And uh, he and Max Komasarov took up this uh, MEM and tried to understand the systematics that Bhandari had found. Okay. Why does it uh, work in these cases? But all this was one dimensional. And, uh, I was a bit slower on the uptake, but uh, Ramesh sort of persuaded me to get involved. So I, even after Max left, we sat down and wrote two dimensional programs for some of the primitive computers we had at that time. Uh, but there was also an important insight into why these different functions worked. And it took some of the mystery out of it because there were already two schools of thought. Uh, the CSIR school said you have to uh, maximize the integral of the logarithm of the brightness. That will enforce positivity and so on. But the Cambridge school said uh, you have to do minus B log B. And there was all kinds of debate. So finally, uh, I think we settled it by showing a whole class of functions which will do the job. People seem to like it anyway. Uh, but I have to say that as far as imaging is concerned, uh, already before the period that I'm talking about, in the early 1960s, the real revolution came from Cambridge and it came from Martin Ryle. And initially it came, uh, the title of this picture in Wikipedia or anywhere else is The Remains of the telescope used in the 4C survey. Okay. So uh, this was at a frequency of 178 megahertz. Okay. And uh, Martin Trial was known for, you know, thinking deeply, doing something, and then talking about it. Right? He, he wouldn't keep putting out results every now and then. So uh, here's a picture from his paper in Nature, right? Explaining uh, the principle of what is now called aperture synthesis. Uh, <clears throat> basically, the realization was that you didn't need these long rows of antennas, which the Australians were using, and which they could use because they had the funds. Martin Royal did not have them. Okay. So initially, he started working with pairs of antennas, and, and that would give a you know, quite a complicated pattern. And actually, uh, he and his group came to Greece because sometimes they found some false radio sources with this. But uh, he then realized that the best way to do this is to have these two antennas, let the Earth rotate, take all the data, combining the signals. Uh, he also had an important innovation called the phase switch. Uh, again, the Australian work, as far as I can understand it, always used the total power. Right. And he said, what we are really interested in is the variation, not the total power. Okay. So uh, the phase switch took care of that. And uh, then sequentially, you could move this pair of antennas to different separations. Okay. So this was the concept, right? which became aperture synthesis, which is the way radio astronomy, 99% of it is done in the world today. Okay? So certainly, uh, the 1974 Nobel Prize was uh, well-deserved. Okay? Mm. But I would like to show you a little uh, bit from his uh, Nobel lecture. It also illustrates the principle that uh, behind every successful man, there has to be a woman. Now, in the case of uh, the discoverer of pulsars, or the person who got the Nobel Prize for his student discovering pulsars, the woman was uh, Miss Jocelyn Bell, whom you've heard of. Right. But uh, in Martin Ryle's case, uh, this is his, uh, the map which his uh, research student produced. It was a pilot. They wanted to know whether the system would work. Okay, with that same antenna I showed you. So uh, just let me read you the first part. It says, Miss Ann Neville and I set up an experimental system to test the method and develop the computing. So the elaborate computations that the government did now had to be done in the computers in Cambridge, which incidentally were shared with the crystallographers. Okay, we also had to take Fourier transforms, as we've seen. <coughs> and, and the rest of the sentence explains you know, exactly what they did in the Nobel lecture. But that's interesting. And if you read the paper, which I did in preparing for this lecture, you'll see that it, it was in every way as tedious a process as before. Right? You see even the way the plot is done. Whole number of these one-dimensional plots plotted on a paper. If you have used the computers of the early 60s, uh, <laughs> you would realize that uh, 
this was uh, a lot of hard work. So in some sense, she deserves credit. I also wondered, and here I think the first Govind Swaroop memorial lecturer, or maybe even the first and uh, uh, second will have to forgive me because they're from Australia. And one can ask, the Australians had four brilliant radio astronomers, the four people with whom Govind did his internship. Uh, they had the funds. CSIRO had much more funds than Cambridge University. They built these big arrays. Okay. But, and in fact, Christiansen himself has given that uh, early work on the sun, saying this is the first example of using Earth rotation. Right? But this vital clue that you would just take a pair and you could just look at uh, the oscillatory component, forget the average, somehow that seems to have been missed. Um, so again, to bring in another story which is not that well known, it's not that the Australian group did not know this, because even in late 1940s, there is a paper by Christiansen, McCready, and Payne Scott, which explains the output of a single interferometer and says in so many words that if you have a distribution there, uh, this single interferometer measures uh, the Fourier component, which is like saying that it multiplies it by a sine wave and adds it all. Okay. Uh, this result is attributed to the most mathematical of the three authors, who is this Payne Scott. But from Payne Scott, you will not find out uh, the gender of the person. This is the Ruby Payne Scott. So if she had stayed on with the group, maybe you know they would have also reached a rotation aperture synthesis in the right manner. And she didn't stay on. And the reason is very interesting. CSIRO had a rule that uh, once a woman employee gets married, she has to leave. This is 1950s. Okay, so she got married. Kept it secret for a while, <laughs> but finally she had to leave. So who knows? <laughs> Maybe that's why they missed that opportunity. Now, a crucial role is played when you combine all these waves by lining up properly, lining them up properly. If you want to build up a point source, all these waves have to have a maximum at the same point. Okay? And for that, you can't afford. <laughs> to position the wave wrongly, you have to get the phases right. Now, first of all, the phases in the instrument have to be adjusted. In fact, there's a particularly ingenious technique developed by Govind and Yang, his colleague in uh, Stanford, to do this very quickly and efficiently. Um, and, uh, but there are phases over which you do not have control, the ionosphere. Uh, and in his Nobel lecture, Ryle mentions all this because he's trying to look to the future. And interestingly, uh, he's somewhat pessimistic. You can read his Nobel lecture. But something came along later, right? In 1980, 81. I remember this vividly because by 80, 81, we were playing around with imaging uh, at RRI. And from the neighboring, you know, TFR center, uh, Chris Salter sort of cycled up or whatever mode of transport he used in those days, clutching this paper, which was called, uh, yeah, this was, oops, what did I do? It again. Ah, a new method for making maps with phase unstable into radio interferometers. So this was from the other group in England, uh, Jordan Mack, who of course did not do aperture synthesis. They put all their money into a big dish. Uh, I mean, that's separate history of uh, new techniques that they invented. But finally, they decided to get into this interferometry game, uh, but put dishes all over England Link them with radio links. So it was called Merlin, multi element radio link interferometer. But you couldn't get the phases absolutely right. And they say that necessity is the mother of invention. Okay. So uh, from that group, Conwell and Wilkinson came up with this uh, thing, which has, they actually called it, I think, Cortel, correction of telescopes. But today it is universally known as self calibration, which uh, I would try and uh, explain in the following way. We all do it to some extent. If you have, uh, if you look through uh, a microscope, you keep turning the knob until the image looks right. If you have binoculars, sometimes you have to turn two knobs. So you want to extend this principle. You have, say, 30 telescopes in GMRT. And the advantage is you can do it offline. You don't have to do it while the data is being taken. <laughs> while processing the data, you can imagine that each telescope has some phase which you do not know. And you have to play with these 30 phases. Now, that looks like a very large number of uh, parameters to play with. But please remember that there are 435 uh, measurements in this case, right? 
So I think uh, the philosophy of Cornwell and Wilkinson, uh, I think is summed up in a proverb. I know the Tamil version, but translated it reads, once the water goes over your head, it doesn't matter if it goes by one span or one cubit, right? <laughs> so once you're playing this dangerous game of deconvolution, right? Uh, you might as well throw in 30 more parameters in addition to the 435 and see when you get the best image. And the important thing about this is it worked. And it, for example, VLA was being built at that time. They designed it saying, okay, there's something called dynamic range, which I would define as the ratio of fact to artifact. <laughs> <laughs> the strongest source <laughs> to, you know, the weakest noise that you don't believe. Okay. Uh, they aim for 500. But they're getting tens of thousands. And it's entirely because of self-care. <laughs> okay, now I get to the other theme. The exploration of uh, the structures, structure of matter by means of X-rays, particularly in the crystalline form. Okay. I mean, that's the subject I was trained in to some extent in NAL. And already from the two examples I gave you was a very well-represented subject in India. So this begins with this picture. Uh, so there's this uh, eminent German physicist, actually eminent for his work in relativity and so on, called Lauer, okay? Uh, and uh, he uh, received the Nobel Prize for proving that X-rays actually consist of waves because that wasn't obvious at that time, right? And uh, his idea was that you pass through a crystal, the separation between the atoms is of the order of well, he didn't know the wavelength of X-rays, but he said, even if the X-ray wavelength is as short as that, you might get diffraction. Now, actually, you can see similar spots if you just look at a distant street lamp through a feather or a nylon dupatta or anything. <laughs> it's two-dimensional diffractions, except this is three-dimensional diffraction because it's a crystal. It's a crystal, and he received uh, the Nobel Prize for proving the nature of X-rays in the year 1914. Uh, this paper uh, drew a lot of attention. In fact, people who attended the lecture then immediately wrote to their friends. So one of them is a professor in Manchester, and he was holidaying with his son, who had just graduated in Cambridge. So they discussed it. So the son went away, and he uh, read the lower paper and realized that he had got something right and something wrong. Okay. So uh, he reanalyzed the data. Lauer could, had to explain each of these spots, postulating different wavelengths. Maybe this spot is that wavelength and so on. Whereas uh, this young man uh, was able to explain every single spot, including even the shape of those spots, by postulating this structure for zinc sulfide. Okay? And the vital step was that Lauer had taken the, maybe being a theoretical physicist, not a chemist, he just said, there is some zinc sulfide and we'll put it in, in a cube. And that doesn't quite explain it. You have to put uh, zinc in the center of the uh, faces of the cube as well. That paper shows remarkable geometric insight. It was presented. So Lauer is July and by November, this was presented by this absurdly looking young man, Lawrence Bragg. Meanwhile, of course, uh, Lawrence Bragg had nothing. He was just a fresh graduate in Cambridge. Maybe he had a fellowship in some college. His father, of course, went away to Manchester and built a spectrometer where you could do these on a large number of crystals. And uh, they both uh, shared the Nobel Prize in 1915 uh, at the age of... This is a very serious problem. If you get a Nobel Prize at the age of 25, what do you do after that? <laughs> right? but, and actually, it is recorded in the more personalized accounts that this did worry Lawrence Bram. He was also worried that... Uh, his father would, uh, you know, Lauer had three equations which were very complicated. He was able to reduce it to one equation, which all of you may, must have studied, right? And his father would say, yes, there's this equation derived by my son. He wouldn't even mention this. And apparently it worried him. So there is sibling rivalry, but in this case, it looks like there was a certain tension between them. Anyway, they shared the Nobel Prize, right? And he went, he replaced his father in Manchester, solved the entire set of structures in the mineral kingdom. And then he was invited to the Cavendish laboratory when Rutherford died. And apparently he said, uh, it was full of nuclear physics because you know a lot of things, discovery of the neutron and so on had happened there. 
So Bragg is supposed to have said, we have taught the world how to do nuclear physics. Let us teach them to do some, something else. So the something, there were two something else's. One was uh, crystal structures, but now moving on to the biologically important ones, okay? proteins and so on. Uh, he, he didn't contribute much there himself, but he encouraged a large group. And the second, actually, it started with ionospheric studies, including people like Ratcliffe, and then moved on to radio astronomy. And uh, it is recorded by people like Ryle that they got the maximum inspiration from Bragg. They also had to share the computing facilities because. So let me tell you a little bit more about uh, crystallography, not too much. Okay. Uh, first of all, here you are dealing with a three dimensional distribution of uh, the scattering, which is the electron density. Okay? And each spot uh, is something like a baseline in uh, radio astronomy. It gives you a particular wave that's particularly clear in Bragg's way of thinking about it. You think of the crystal as made up of layers, and if the wavelength fits properly into these layers, then right, you've got information about that Fourier component. And then you have to do it in all directions. Uh, that theme we have seen already. Okay. However, in this case, there is no phase measure. You have no way of aligning these waves. Right? So, in fact, the way that Bragg solved the structure was his geometric insight. Incidentally, uh, this is all taught. A structure of sodium chloride is taught maybe even in the 10th standard, right? That uh, you have sodiums and chlorines alternating in this arrangement. And this is early. Right? But apparently, chemists were very unhappy because they've been brainwashed into thinking that you know sodium and chlorine would be kind of monogamous. Right? <laughs> one sodium, one chlorine next to each other. And the next NACL is somewhere else. And this structure was, of course, not at all like that, right? Each, you know, NA was surrounded by so many CLs and so on. But of course, we know that that's true. Hmm? But again, an interesting episode in the history of science. So this is forward modeling. You come up with a model and then... Then, uh, when you have problems with phases in radio astronomy, sometimes something which helps is the calibrator. Right? So you know the calibration is there, you know it's strong, you adjust the phases or you use the calibrator to find out the phases. Something similar happens in uh, crystal structure analysis. You put in a heavy atom, ID, where many of the atoms are just lighter. Yeah. It acts like a kind of calibrator. So that method was used and continues to be used. So these biological molecules don't contain <laughs> things like osmium and so on, but uh, the crystallographers will happily introduce them in order to take advantage of this. Then, uh, I haven't talked about closure phase, but it's very much related to the story of self-calibration, which I told you about. Uh, it's a sort of very particular case when you're dealing with just three antennas. And a similar concept dealing with three spots, if you like, or uh, I think they are called reflections, because Bragg told you to think about them as reflections. Okay? Uh, so very similar concepts occurred in both fields. Uh, and uh, these closure phases could be adjusted to build up the atoms, okay? Here you have the strong a priori information that matter, matter is made up of atoms. So if your Fourier transform shows you, you know, things all over the place, you know it's wrong. And uh, methods were developed using computers to utilize these triplet invariants as they are called. So that was progress. Right? And the final progress occurred when people started exploiting the fact that you can vary the wavelength of the X-rays. Now, of course, if all the atoms scatter in the same way at all wavelengths, that doesn't help. But those of you who have undergone DEXA scan, you know, which is dual energy X-ray absorption, know that if they want to distinguish the calcium in your bones as opposed to the other stuff there, they would use two wavelengths. So the contribution of calcium would be different at these two wavelengths. Uh, that is just ordinary radiography, but uh, the same holds in crystallography. Now, of course, initially people only had to use the wavelengths with the X-ray tubes would give them, but then the synchrotrons came along. I'm, I'm not talking about the synchrotron radiation in outer space, but the one in the laboratory, which the particle physicists were developing, and uh, you make them powerful enough, they will emit X-rays. Okay. And there you can tune the wavelength. In fact, there's one in indoor right now, been built for many years, I think it's taken off the ground. Then you get a new data set where the weightage of the atoms is different, and once you have more numbers, you have a better chance. Okay. So with all these tools, crystallographers marched ahead, and uh, so here is something which looks like that same Lowe picture that I showed you, okay? 
but it's a picture of a biological molecule. Uh, you see only very few spots. It's also taken on a CCD detector, which has a huge dynamic range. So you may not see many of the spots. Actually, there are millions of spots. Huh? Okay. Uh, of course, there's a problem. This uh, crystal of the biological molecule itself is very difficult to make. It's a few millimeters in size. You put it in the synchrotron, and then after some time, it kind of you know, it's burnt up. Then you put another one and take more data. And so, so that's the way it works. Okay. So what is the molecule? Okay. So now I'm talking of uh, turn of the century work in crystallography. So here it is. This is an incredible <laughs> biological machine called uh, the ribosome. It's, uh, all of you have lots of ribosomes and all your cells. It sounds like science fiction, honestly. I, I talk to my biology colleagues and they take it for granted. And yes, you have the ribosome and uh, it, uh, you know, what is it? A messenger RNA goes to the gene and then, you know, brings the genetic code here. And then it sits on the ribosome. The ribosome reads three of the, <laughs> you know, base pairs. And then it uh, talks to something called a transfer RNA, which goes and brings that amino acid and attaches it to this chain. So people have been trying to understand this machine. And here's this machine with every atom in it placed, right? Hundreds of thousands of atoms. And you agree that each atom has at least uh, six or seven parameters, right? Where it is, and how strong it is, and so on. So you need that much data for sure. And uh, this was the kind of race. Okay? And uh, so the ribosome structure was uh, worked on by these three people. They are looking quite pleased with themselves because they got the Nobel Prize right? <laughs> in 2009, right? And uh, so I think you would agree, if you're sort of comparing crystallography and uh, radio imaging, that in 2009, the real uh, bragging rights belong to the crystallographers, okay? However, in 2009, two young men on the two sides of the Atlantic, decided to go for the most extreme form of radio imaging. Okay. So the wavelength to be pushed down to a millimeter, the baseline to be taken to tens of thousands, I mean, 10,000 kilometers, can't do anything bigger on the Earth. And the target was uh, the black hole, both in the center of our own galaxy and M87. This is a story which has been told many times, so I'm just using it as sort of uh, to round off the stock. Uh, it wasn't an easy job because there were lots of telescopes in high mountains built for studying interstellar molecules. Uh, and the directors of these telescopes who all spoke different languages <laughs> had to be persuaded to, you know, allot observing time, you know, put in equipment, make modifications. So this is, took almost a decade. So by uh, 2017, the data was taken. As I said, that's a story. I, uh, I'm just staying away from the details. And... Uh, but again, if you ask what was happening in principle, you were recording these Fourier components. Okay. And then it took about two years to come up with this image. Not as impressive as a ribosome, okay, but a lot of physics and astrophysics in it. You might have heard of a theorem that a black hole has no hair, so you must be wondering what that hair is hanging from the black hole. So first of all, it's not in the black hole, it's around it. And secondly, it's the polarization. I kept polarization for the end, because it's a kind of favorite subject, so I didn't want to spend too much time on it. But their study includes polarization. Um, and in fact, cells calibration with polarization is an interesting topic in itself. And I will resist the temptation to tell you more about it in this form. Okay. So, back to Govind. Right? Um, I've just listed, he was a dreamer amongst so many other things. Intensely practical person also. Radio telescopes attracting users from all over the world. Right. An inter-university center, I mean, in the 1960s, he had persuaded Baba to allow land for inter-university center near uh, Doki telescope at that time. Okay. And, uh, and then a science university for all branches of natural science and on the same scale and the same funding and the same prestige as the IITs. So, uh, so there are his dreams, and in some measure, as Amir Khosrow would say, Hameen Nasto, Hameen Nasto, Hameen Nasto, they are all here, right? Uh, so the lesson we will draw from the imaging story is that uh, you, have the, you have the amplitude, you have the strength, but uh, you have to get the phases. But 
<laughs> so, if, so one hopes that uh, not just for Govind's sake, but for our own sake, something marvelous emerges from this concentration of uh, these remarkable resources in Pune. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Maharaja. We have a, a large audience online as well. Uh, so what I will do is uh, we will first take questions from uh, uh, in-person audience, and then uh, I will uh, call upon the mm -hmm. online audience. So questions. So I guess the comment uh, about the the Australians. Mm. So it was actually Joe Pazzi, not Chris Christensen, in that McCready and Payne Scott paper. Mm, no, okay. I, got, I got the authors yeah. now. Okay. But the, the interesting thing is that they actually were doing the C clip in Tetherometer. Right, but after that they switched to total. Exactly, which is very strange, right? It's exactly yeah. the period of the late 40s. Why did that happen? I think they, that's because they retired Ruby Payne that's Scott. That's maybe. Maybe. She was a mathematician now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, I mean, people keep saying that Ryle used the uh, one. Once it did the theorem and so on. But I think the accounts say that, you know, he did the job first and then someone told him it is the Vance Ted Zanikin theorem. He said, okay, <laughs> maybe it is. Or Michael's in a different Thank you. Yeah, so, so Bragg actually was, he did a fair amount of stuff with Max Peruth's, Lawrence Bragg, uh, William Lawrence Bragg, did a fair amount of stuff with Max Peruth's actually on hemoglobin. Yes. And uh, one of, uh, Crick actually, the first thing that he did in that group was to actually kill their model. Which, was, was to? Uh, Crick actually killed their model uh -huh. because which Bragg wanted to kick him out of the MRC. Okay. And that caused Bragg to stop doing, uh, to actually stop doing crystallography himself. Okay. Max Perutz, I thought, continued crystallography yeah, so for hemoglobin. So Perutz actually kept doing it and got a Nobel finally, ah. along with John Kendrick. Ah. Bragg himself stopped. Ah, okay. okay. Right. See, it's also true that he was, you know, running a big thing. Okay, so you mentioned uh, three streams, medical imaging, crystallography, and, and radio astronomy, mm -hmm. which are sort of use similar ideas and principles. Mm. Uh, in your opinion, which one of them has made the best use? And has, uh, what would you say? See, the nature of the problem is a little different in each case. So <laughs> beyond the general principles, I would say that each has taken its own direction. But uh, the direction of merging away, again, in a way that uh, I'm not very happy with, but uh, let me tell you anyway. Um, I think I told you I have a little personal interest in the imaging of uh, this ring and so on. So there's a collaboration which started in uh, the COVID period. Uh, there's a Nityanandan who is no relative, but who was a project group here for a while. And uh, he's now in Perth. So uh, he and I were struggling with this self-calibration of polarization. It required some higher mathematics, which then we turned to a colleague in RRI, Joseph Samuel, and uh, we, we think we have a nice way of doing it. But of course, again, there's a Kannada proverb which says that even the mongoose thinks that its own child is beautiful. So, <laughs> so don't, don't take that very seriously. <laughs> but in any case, I started taking interest in this whole uh, field. And Nitya has, of course, continued. He's a professional radio astronomer. And Samuel is the professional gate theorist. And I could be the go-between. Anyway, so now it turns out that including the EHT collaboration, Everyone is turning to AI. <laughs> okay, so what you do is, and of course the reason is that the data itself is still somewhat sparse. You're not able to pin down everything. Okay, so then you train this neural network on a large number of simulated images, okay? and then give it your real data and you give it, and then it produces something. So Nitya is doing it. I think the HD people are doing it. I'm certain the medical imaging people are doing it, and there uh, it's just one huge program which, and if those of you who have studied neural networks and AI will know that you may understand the individual steps in the program, but no one understands exactly what's going on inside. So I think these fields may all converge. So next time you go to you know, 
or not you, but one of us goes to, you know, Ruby Hall or something. No, I've actually met a young lady in Bangalore. He works on Siemens. I said, oh, do you work on, uh, you know, uh, these uh, medical imaging devices? She said, no, no, I, we work on software. We, we just give the doctors some extra software, which gets more information about the image. So obviously it's AI. So I think as it gets more and more complicated, but uh, it's still important to get the results. Yeah. AI may be raising its head, ugly or beautiful, depending on the way you think. Crystallography has happened. Google has something called alpha fold. So, uh, you know, you don't, you just tell it the sequence of this protein. And then it'll tell you how it folds up. And it, they trained it on all the known structures. And today, <laughs> it seems to be doing well. <laughs> so, what do you want that? I thought for medical imaging, you need to have <laughs> what you might consider an IQS sample sort of data. So, what is the missing information? There? No, yeah. Well, except if they don't want to completely fry you, they would try to reduce the number of scans that they take. So I, I think it's an interesting thing. I think it's tried by the X-rays, or the doctors remove the tumor from here instead of here. I don't know you have to find it. <laughs> but uh, so I, I think they do try to minimize those that also. So they will do exactly the right amount and not more. And there, if the algorithms improve or the understanding improves, surely. Uh, I, I would say it's a somewhat uh, benign problem, <laughs> even though the objects they study are not benign. Yeah. compared to crystallography. Yeah. Uh, see, radio imaging, this is, not, this is not huge data. It's huge data when it's taken. But when it's finally processed, I think there are some 45 points in that image, not, not more than that. So any particular reason all of the three dreams happened in Pune? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, see, it's not going well, considered many locations for the camera. It's happened. So no, I am not able to. Uh, of course, in the case of Ayuka, it's not going to be creative, right? Because his colleague in PR for Jan And for him, I think Pune was at the home. Okay, uh, from the online audience, uh, would anyone like to ask a question? From the room, uh, is there anyone? Uh, hello? Hello? Am I audible? Yes. Uh, yes. Jitendra here from GMRT. This is just out oh. of curiosity. Uh, in future, whether gravitational field will be uh, can possible to image, and how it will be? Means, what is your perspective? Uh, okay. Uh, am I audible, Jitendra? Yes. Yes. You can hear yes, me. sir. Yeah. So actually, yes. I happen to be in ICTS where people do a lot of work on gravitational waves, and as in the other cases, I look over their shoulders and talk to them. Right now. Uh, I wouldn't say they do imaging in the conventional sense. They, they look at a signal in the time domain. However, uh, the group there actually uh, is now looking at a phenomenon which has not yet been detected. But as uh, LIGO improves, they will get hundreds of such cases, which is the gravitational lensing of gravitational waves. So then there will actually be an image. You'll have uh, gravitational waves reaching you from a number of points, perhaps interfering with each other. So at least at the theoretical level, they are already preparing themselves. How would we analyze such data? And it's a completely different problem from, uh, and of course you might have more than one gravitational wave detector. So yes, people are thinking of imaging in this sense. In some fraction of these gravitational wave events sooner or later will be imaged. Otherwise it's like a point source. And then the interest is in the time, time dependence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Please ask your question.
Okay, anyone else uh, on the Zoom? At the moment, uh, so you talked about MEN. Yes. And MEN was hugely exciting in the certainly when I was doing my PhD in the 90s, mm. there, there would be heated arguments between about MEN versus clean and so on, certainly with extended sources. And somehow that has changed now. So it's partly because of the user Gaussians. Why do you feel that uh, MEM has, uh, is, there, is there an obvious reason why MEM has declined in its use? Okay, let me, uh, uh, first of all, if you look at the EHT, they used every possible imaging method, yeah. including form. So I think they were just hedging their bets. Okay. Now, so my perspective on it now uh, is that uh, if your data is not extensive enough to constrain the image completely, and it rarely is, there is some space of images which is consistent with the data, right? And then you would like to uh, select them. So actually, there is an interest, there is a, a philosophy which is just the opposite of MEM. MEM, uh, of course, it builds up peaks according to the data, but it also creates a kind of flat background. Hmm? And interestingly, it also sharpens the peaks and flattens the background. That's what it does. Okay. Now there is another philosophy which. Actually, people were talking about people like Ronnie Kers. They called it maximum emptiness. They said, okay, look at all the possible maps that you can create with this set of data. Uh, you may put in positivity, but it's not absolutely essential. Find the one which occupies the minimum number of pixels. Now, this is actually the, almost the opposite of MEM. You know, you're trying to concentrate everything. And this has a big vogue. I, I didn't mention it. It's called compressed sensing. And uh, the fact that a Fields Medal winning mathematician has proved some theorems on it, has added to the attraction. I know that uh, Jaron and Neeraj were playing around with it. And uh, so I think, uh, actually, I would like to, uh, I don't have our the review article by Ramesh and me, but I remember arguing with Ramesh and we finally put in this sentence. We said, okay, MEM and all is fine. We have reviewed it for you. But ultimately, any image which is consistent with the data and doesn't actually contradict physical thing uh, cannot be rejected. So we were also hedging our bets, <laughs> even at that time. So yeah, I'm agnostic about uh, things. I, in fact, it'll be nice to have two opposing philosophies and then say, okay, you can either have this or this, and only features that are common to the two should be believed. Hmm. I think continue on that thread. Compressed sensing also, there was a lot of talk about for a bit, but again, it seems to have sort of Right down here. I agree. So I'm, I'm just thinking of it from the conceptual point of view. That, and that's an interesting idea. Minimize the number of pixels. It actually doesn't enforce positivity. If you can gain by putting a negative pixel, but reduce. Yeah. Okay. We have spoken about polarization self calibration. Could you like what are the challenges there that you are encountering? Okay, so for that I'll have to I'll, I'll be, try and be brief. So I told you that in the ordinary self calibration, with each antenna you associate one number. If I didn't tell you what that number was. Uh, so it, it could be a phase, for example, and related to others. Could also be an amplitude. You can combine them as a single complex number. Now, uh, of course, all real radio telescopes have two fields. They could be two linear fields, for example, like this. So you might think, okay, there could be a phase and an amplitude for this one and a phase and an amplitude for that. But actually, it can be more. In fact, at some level, I mean, you may want two dipoles which are perpendicular to each other, they'll never be perfectly perfect. So you will have to allow for what is called mixing. And then there could be a phase going there. I mean, you, again, you have electronics behind these two. Cannot be absolutely identical. Right? So when you actually ask what you have to put at each telescope, it now turns out to be a two into two complex matrix, which connects the two incoming 
complex numbers uh, which are God given or sky given to the two complex numbers which come out. So, so now you have to do everything with matrices and matrices don't come you. So, so that is the fun part. So thank you, Rajaram, for the fascinating journey through radio imaging and its cousins. Um, and uh, we conclude the session here. Thank you. All the Canada. <laughs> did it help? Yeah. The information did it help? I did. 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 I did